right. Well, go ahead and get started. Apologies for the, the quiz on the, or the um, alkene nomenclature question on the quiz. That one slipped by me when I gave it a once over. I'm like, oh yeah, we've covered all this stuff. and realized we hadn't actually officially defined like the alkene nomenclature. Y'all did just fine, um, other than missing. and trans, I think everybody forgot. So same general idea. Um, Once I saw like that I got it wrong, I looked back and like, oh yeah, and now I remember like right. double bonds. This right, this exactly. Trans, yeah. um, and then there was um, the uh, the chair compromise for the cyclohexanes. We'll go through those too, because everybody struggled with those. Um, Good random question about OCHEM. If we're looking at two hexene, would it be more stable if it was three hexene or one hexene? And is that going to be due to steric effects? So it turns out the difference between, there is going to be a difference between one hexene and two hexene, but the more obvious one is the difference that you see between um, trans two hexene and cis two hexene. We'll get trans two hexene versus four, six versus cis two hexene. Um, one of those actually is more stable. Which one would we expect to be more stable? Why? Yeah, because we're pointing the big pieces in opposite directions, so they're not bumping into each other as much. So there, there definitely is a difference there. Um, and I wanted to mention something we'll go into significantly in, um, in a little bit though. Turns out there's another aspect here as well. Um, if you look at, so yeah, so there's the cis versus the trans. And so we can actually look at these regardless of how big the overall molecule is. We can get an idea of um, how stable this pi bond is by looking at what's called the heat of hydrogenation. So remember, we looked at heat of combustion before when we were looking at things to look at steric forces. Heat of hydrogenation is even more specific because we're not taking everything and turning it into CO2 and water. So all we're doing is we're looking at the carbon-carbon pi bond and adding a hydrogen to each side. So we break the pi bond and we make two new sigma bonds. So that one's really, really focused. It doesn't matter at all how big the molecule is. We can look at the heat of hydrogenation and get an idea of how stable that pi bond specifically is. Um, and so when we do that, we do see that it's more downhill in energy by about four kilojoules per mole um, to, for the cis isomer versus the trans isomer. So the trans isomer is going to be more stable like you would expect from the sterics. Um, the other piece of this, though, is if you look at, um, there was a, there's another piece to this in terms of, and I kind of put these out of order. Um, if you look at the heat of hydrogenation for, say, ethylene versus propene, and ethylene is just the old school name for ethene, would be the, the IUPAC way of naming it. Um, there's a difference in energy. It's not as downhill in energy if you added a carbon to your your alkene. If you go from what they call mono substituted, so propene to butene, once again, it's even more stable. So it turns out that when you look at adding these these various R groups to an alkene, the more R groups you have around that alkene, the more stable it is which we wouldn't necessarily expect just from sterics. The sterics kind of fight against that. And we can still see that four kilojoules per mole difference if we look at the cis versus the transfer butene. And if we look at putting both methyls on the same carbon, so that would be methyl propene is, um, has, is similar to the cis. So there's still some sterics affecting that molecule, which would look like
but this also has some sterics affecting it as well, right? Similar to the trans, the trans is just operating, or sorry, the cis is just operating across the double bond and still seeing some sterics versus on the same carbon. Um, and so the reasoning for this is something that we'll, we'll spend a lot more time in when we start looking at, at reactions of alkenes um, and when we start looking at carbocations, because it turns out that's the same phenomenon that, that stabilizes carbocations as stabilizes these alkenes. You guys remember when we talked about how very like different carbocations are going to be more stable? Like it's like, oh, if there's resonance, then it's, that helps it a lot. But then if there's no resonance, then it's the more substituted is the more stable. Same logic is here. More substituted alkenes are more stable. And it turns out it's because if you put a pi bond, so here's a pi bond here, next to a carbon with this with sigma bonds, the sigma bonds aren't, they're sp3 hybridized. They can't do true conjugation or resonance structures, but they can kind of still line up a little bit so that they overlap slightly. So they can donate some electron density to that pi bond, even though they can't really go through a resonance structure. So they call that hyperconjugation. Um, and it's the exact same thing that's happening when you've got a, a carbocation, because a carbocation um, it also has an unhybridized p orbital, right? That's why when it's a carbocation, there is no electron in that p orbital, so it doesn't hybridize it. And the same thing can happen where you blend some electron density from the carbon next door to sort of partially fill that a little bit to make it a little bit more stable. And so we see that as well with alkenes, which is um, which is kind of interesting. So mainly, this is jumping ahead, but I thought that that was a really good question, and I thought it was worth looking at both of the aspects of well, why is less substituted more stable versus why is more substituted more stable. Um, and it winds up being a fairly significant um, sort of factor there. The diagram on the right, is that kind of showing the same thing, like the donut that we saw with the cycle? Exactly. It's sort of like a, it's an overlay of all of, of the orbitals. And I don't, I think this one kind of exaggerates a little bit. You don't, you wouldn't see quite so much overlap as it makes it look like here because that is a pi pi full sigma bond. Um, but they're just trying to show that really you would get sort of the superposition of both of those orbitals. And then other quiz questions. Everybody asked relevant questions this week, which is always fun. Um, also tells me that maybe we're going a little too fast um, in some places. Um, what property of a molecule causes it to become op optically active? Uh, might not be obvious why that one's relevant because we haven't defined optically active yet. Um, but it turns out those enantiomers, those non-superimposable mirror images that we, we ended talking about last Thursday, that is what creates an optically active molecule. And by optically active, what that means is if you have one mirror image but not the other, so If we had, say, um, say we had bromobutane, like we're going to make in lab today. Bromobutane has an asymmetric center, right? It has a carbon, carbon two, the one with bromine on it has in four different substituents attached to it. If you have just one of those stereoisomers, just one of those enantiomers, and it's, as a pure substance, it basically, it, it's almost like it acts like a, um, a rotor when light, polarized light passes through this material. The polarized, polarized light means that all the waves are going in the same direction, are all going up and down, arbitrarily decided, but they're all the same direction. And when they when the those waves pass through a pure enantiomer, it rotates the polarized light by a set amount in the direction it rotates, or how much it rotates the polarized light depends on the concentration and what the substance is. Um, but the direction it rotates the polarized light 
is based on whether or not you have the right-handed molecule versus the left-handed molecule. Mm -hmm. If the right-handed molecule rotates light one way, the left-handed molecule rotates light the other way. And I have to be careful with my language because what we define as the right-handed molecule doesn't necessarily rotate light clockwise. Um, because we, we're using an arbitrary naming system to, to decide we're calling this right-handed versus left-handed, which doesn't necessarily match up with the physical properties of rotating polarized light. You can have the right-handed molecule that rotates light left. And so we have two different ways of naming. So that's what an opti optically active material is. And it stems from almost always that you've got an asymmetric center and it's relatively pure stereoisomer where you don't have a mix. You have a mixture of both of these, the right-handed and the left-handed in equal amounts, then, well, yeah, okay, if the right-handed molecule is gonna rotate it one way, then it's gonna bump into a left-handed molecule next and that's gonna rotate it the other way. Back to the other. So there's no net change if you have an equal amount of both in the antiverse. But if you have more one than the other, then there's a net change in how well it rotates. So I'm kind of in trouble uh, understanding like, you have like a solution and all these molecules are oriented in different mm -hmm. like orientations. It, kind of, how does the light like uh, uh, polarize in the same like a single direction? Um, we'd have to get into the physics of how light travels through a material versus a vacuum. Um, the the easy way I always kind of think about it is you can think of the light as wind and think of these as tiny propellers. And if you're passing wind through a, through a field of windmills, yeah, it's gonna spin the windmills, but the wind itself is gonna change a little bit too as it passes through those, right? Because then propellers also are optically, are not optically active, are also chiral, right? There's right-handed propellers versus left-handed propellers. And so it, it kind of is a good analogy You've just got a giant field of these propellers, and when you pass the light through it, the light itself, if all the propellers start rotating one way, the light, just by conservation of uh, momentum, is going to start rotating the other way. That's not a perfect analogy, but it's good enough for understanding the practical effects. And if you want to get into how light propagates through materials, then you should be a material science major. And uh, and you can go study that and report back to me. <laughs> um, how are chair flips observed empirically? Good, very relevant question, right? Um, typically, a lot of times it's with X-ray crystallography. If you get these materials to form a solid crystal, you're going to be able to pass X-rays through them bounce the x-rays off and you can you can plot out where all the atoms are relative to each other and at different temperatures you can get a different proportion of them are in the the favored state versus the not favored state based on what how big the substituents are and what the difference in energy is between them so if you had like a two chloro get trans one methyl three chloro um, cyclohexane. You can look at, okay, those are two different substituents. We can look at what's the ratio where one's in the axial versus one's in the equatorial versus, and look at the relative sizes, and you can work backwards and sort of make everything sort of match up that way. Um, it's still a lot of number crunching. It's not like we can, we can physically get a microscope out and say, oh yeah, that one's definitely in the, in the axial combination. Um, but there are ways we can observe it um, and the other thing that we can see is actually, we actually see some freezing point depression. If you think back to your colligative properties for gen from Gentum, um, it was freezing point depression, delta T F is equal to a uh, constant KF times the molality rather than the molarity, right? That weird unit that only shows up in polygative properties as taught in Gen Chem um, times what was the, what's the last factor? Is that I'm missing something. There's, there's a third factor, but the, the basic, what I'm trying to 
um, get at is that that molality of the impurity um, is going to affect your freezing point, right? And if you have two different conformers of the same molecule, they're interfering with each other's crystal structures because they're backwards, right? They don't fit in quite as well. And if they're interfering with each other's crystal structures, that means that they basically are acting like a solute. The one that's less common is acting like a solute. So we can actually see a change in freezing point compared to what the molecule should be based on what that, that ratio is of axial to axial versus equatorial equatorial, um, which gets a little bit tricky because if that's the case, how do you measure your freezing point in the first place? Um, if the pure substance itself acts to interfere with it, um, but you can use some some predictions and plotting things. Say, okay, well, this one should be freezing here, and we actually see it freezing a little bit lower, and work backwards to figure out that that's because of those different conformers. Um, so again, chemistry is one of the trickiest things about chemistry is that we don't get to measure anything directly. Everything that we measure, we have to then like, even like figuring out how many moles we have to add of something, right? We have to measure mass and then convert to moles. Um, and then we're using a measured number there, right? So whenever to measure anything directly, but some of the ways that they can get to these, um, to measuring these phenomena are rigorous, even if they're very convoluted. Yeah. Could you use magnetic resonance to identify some of these different? Um, yeah, so, so NMR. Um, nuclear magnetic resonance is another way of looking at what how many of them are in one shape versus another because they're going to interfere with each other differently if they're in the axial position versus the equatorial position. Um, and when we get to defining how NMR works, that might make more sense. But basically, having the hydrogens physically closer to each other is going to change how they call it coupled they are to the other hydrogens um, magnetic fields. Gotcha. Um, and then, so Nikki, I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit to see and ask what you meant by stationary phases. I looked it up and um, I think it's more for biochemistry. Okay. Because I think I was talking about like reactions and stuff. Okay, so yeah, so we use the term like, stationary phase for chromatography, right? And for, for gas, for GC, the stationary phase is the two, is the packing of the two that everything moves through. Um, and so in general, it does get used a ton in biochemistry and you can change out, like we've done it mostly based on boiling point, right? With our packed column, that basically stationary phase in the packed column was the glass beads. Um, and in the gas in the GC, the um, stationary phase was the tube and the filling for the tube, because that didn't move, and the and the two compounds passed through it, carried by the gases. So stationary phases in biochemistry get way more interesting in some ways because rather than just sorting by molecular weight or sorting by boiling point, like we do with GC or distillation. Um, you can basically take those glass beads, they make the glass, they're not really glass beads at this point, but you make them really, really small, they increase surface area, like we talked about. But you can, what's called functionalize the surface, where instead of just having just like a physical place for it to condense and re-evaporate, um, you can add favorable versus unfavorable interactions. Uh, you, can, you can cover the surface of your beads with negatively charged um, function groups. If they're negatively charged, they're going to hang on to positively charged molecules better. And so positively charged molecules will move through that phase slower than a negatively charged molecule that's not going to interact with them at all. And then, or you can do things like um, you can add tiny pores to the surface of the beads that are big enough for some molecules to basically they can get trapped in temporarily. Um, but but too small for really big molecules to fit in. So you can wind up sorting by size that way. Um, and so you, there's a lot of different ways you can functionalize these surfaces. And you can do that for chiral molecules. Turns out that right-handed molecules interact better with other right-handed molecules. And so if you functionalize the surface of your beads with right-handed molecules, left-handed molecules pass through faster than the right-handed molecules do. 
So you can actually separate by chirality, even if you had a one-to-one -one mixture of your two right-handed and left-handed molecules, you can separate them by um, using liquid chromatography if you use the right beads. They still call them beads, even though they're like, they, they look like a powder. They're so small that they, um, that it's like, like sugar crystals almost. Um, but, and then they've all been functionalized based on how you're trying to separate things out. People are very, chemists and biochemists have been gotten very, very clever with how they have to figure these things out, right? Because how else do you separate these two things? Um, because they have identical properties. They're right-handed and left-handed versions of the same molecule, same boiling point, same melting point, same polarity, same charges. Um, the only thing that's different about them is right-handed versus left-handed. Turns out that's enough. So they do that to like uh, purify like ascorbic acid, like when it's C, because one yeah. person it doesn't biologically. Exactly, or right. lots of medications. Um, in the, the really common example that gets used is um, there was a medication in the 60s called thalidomide. Um, I can spell it. Thalidomide. I think it's an O, not an A, but it might be an A. Um, thalidomide was. Um, was synthesized in a lab. They didn't quite understand the mechanism for it, but they knew that um, that one of the enantiomers of it was really good at preventing nausea. Um, and so they were, it was being used as, as a um, treatment for morning sickness in pregnant women. Um, what they didn't know at the time is that the other enantiomer um, prevents cell growth, um, which, in a pregnant woman, that's a big problem, right? Um, and so in the, the FDA in the US did its job beautifully because they like, no, we don't have enough information. There's one woman in particular at the FDA who kept saying, no, 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 we can't do this. We don't have enough research. And they were prescribing it both in antimers at the same time because that's how they synthesized it. And so why bother separating out the R from the S if, if you don't need to? Because they thought that the one that was causing cell issues um, didn't have any effect. So they were just giving both enantiomers to women. Um, and this woman from, from the FDA basically saved the U.S. from having a huge problem. But there was a whole generation of, of kids um, born in Europe with like, horrendous birth defects, missing limbs, level birth defects, um, as a direct result of the fast-track thalidomide because it seemed like it was a promising medication. So it's a it's a good example of yeah when the, when the FDA is doing their job properly, which is most of the time they're they're one of the most independent regulatory agencies the U.S. still has. The EPA is totally in in oil companies' pockets at this point, but the FDA is, still does a pretty good job of remaining independent independent and demanding evidence before they approve things. Um, but yeah, so that's just one example of if they had just gone to the trouble of separating those two enantiomers out um, and only giving the one that they knew was an anti-nausea drug, then that wouldn't have happened. These days, we, we still don't see it prescribed just because it has such a, a stink, a stigma associated with it after that, that they won't use it um, for, for anything really other than, interestingly enough, um, there's actually been some promising research with the, with the uh, enantiomer that causes problems with cell growth as an anti-cancer drug. Because if you know it prevents cell growth, then that's actually a pretty healthy thing in terms of a cancer patient. You can slow tumor growth if you prescribe that, that one. Um, I don't think they're calling it thalidomide um, for you know, marketing reasons, but... Um, it's it's very much a case of that's a huge reason why you would want to separate those out. Even better is if you're careful with your reactions, usually you can avoid making both stereoisomers at the same level. You can make one but not the other if you're careful with your reaction mechanisms. Um, so are they using both um, enantiomers for the... I guess there would be benefits to using the anti nausea as well. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I've only, I saw a paper. I don't know how it's being prescribed. I just saw 
paper looking at prospective use or prospective anti-cancer drugs and thalidomide was listed, um, which was you know very interesting to me because it said like every organic chemistry class when we teach an antimers, the first example we use is this is why it matters. <laughs> um, so, and then this is from last, last year's quiz questions. Somebody asked if you could make a really long alkane and could you add actually take it and like, twist it into a knot or make it into funny conformers. Um, turns out you can um, make a Stussy S, like those of us who grew up in the 90s. Yeah. I think I think it's, it's kind of every generation figures out you can make that really cool S design at some point, like in fourth or fifth grade, right? And then it's on everything. Um, turns out you can make an alkane into a Stussy symbol. But in theory, you can actually, nanotechnology is, is looking at building things at the atomic level. We're at that level of miniaturization, miniaturization now. So you, they're looking at ways you could do things like linking, making a chain out of cyclohexanes, for instance, which is kind of cool. Um, the more common one is you can do things they've actually looked at using, there's this, this um, C60, Ring or, or um, C60 H0, I think if it's perfect, um, molecule called a buckyball um, that looks like basically the pattern on a soccer ball, but except where that's the skeletal structure. So you have alternating pentagons and hexagons. It's an aromatic molecule and it's 60 carbons. So it's this big ball structure that actually fits uh, a metal ion inside of it pretty well. It's there doing some research looking at if you have that, can we use that for drug delivery so that it doesn't drop the metal ion off too early and only drops it off once it's gotten to the right part of the body where we want that to be delivered again as an anti-cancer um, because most heavy metal ions are a problem in, in our bodies. So, but that also means they interfere with processes that tumors exhibit as well. So, you know, as a way to deliver platinum, which is an anti- um, anti-tumor drug. So I, not only is it a funny meme among chemists, um, it's also like a, a good question. Yes, there is, there are thing, places in chemistry research where we're looking at building these, these structures like that. All right, let's review with the quiz, the quiz questions themselves, not your quiz questions, but the ones I ask you. So, we looked at a lot of one, two. We looked at both versions of one, two di substituted cyclohexane, right? We didn't look at one, three. So out of these, if we're trying to figure out which is going to be more stable, we're gonna to wanna to draw the chair conformers and see if there's gonna be one that allows us, like, and actually can predict from this, there should be one that's gonna be more stable, right? Because one of these, is going to have the same issue as the one two did, right? Where one stuck in the axial means the other one is equatorial. And when it goes through the chair flip, you still get one axial, one equatorial. Um, and that means the other one should have a conformer that where they they can both be equatorial. So it's just a matter of figuring out which one it is. So for let's if you we start by drawing our cyclohexane. And that's called this carbon in one. We have two possibilities, right? And then if you call this carbon three, you have a little. We have the axial and the equatorial as well, right? The one coming out towards us is the equatorial. And here, this is our equatorial. So for this one, for one three, which of these are we gonna draw? Let's, let's say we put the methyl in the axial position here. Where's the methyl gonna go on carbon three, axial or equatorial? For this, sorry, for the cis. Also axial, right? So this is our least stable because they're both axial, but that means if we go through a chair flip, what happens? We get both, both of them equatorial, right? Versus this one, for the trans, if we 
that's going to, if we put one of our methyl groups straight up and down, which draw the same general, that means our second methyl on carbon three is going to wind up being equatorial. So for B, no matter what we do, we're going to wind up with one axial, one equatorial. And for A, we can have both axial or both equatorial. The way it's drawn is not the most stable conformer, but it means that this is the more stable isomer. Mm -hmm. Question when they're uh, in the equatorial position, is there like torsible strain between the methyl groups? And the other when they're both in equatorial? Yeah. Is because, um, I mean, you, not the same way that there is with the axial. When they're, when they're both axial, those one, three interactions are really prevalent uh, because they're both pointed in the same general direction, right? When they're both equatorial, Clear this one. They're both equatorial. Then, yeah, there's going to be some interaction, but they're pointed in opposite directions, right? Like, think about if you have just, if you have your hands pointed like this, it's a lot easier for them to run into each other versus like this, right? They're physically point. Not only are they pointed away from the rest of the ring structure, they're pointed away from each other too, by virtue of being along the equator, so to speak. Right. So going back to that hand thing, mm -hmm. with the with them both axial like that, would that cause any torsional strength as far as like the twisting of those sigma bonds? Because there is the steering force going that way. Right. Well, so there be the there's going to be some twisting, like some it's going to be a hindered rotation for those. They are might be sigma bonds, but they're not going to rotate freely because they're going to bump into each other, especially if you start having um larger molecules or larger substituents rather. When they're doing projections can't rotate freely. Right. So if we had like you yeah. know. So this is one of our carbons, and this is another one that has. Yeah, make that. Obviously, if these two are interacting, this is going to be a lot less stable than if we rotated both of them 180 degrees and had the hydrogens pointed towards each other, right? Mm -hmm. So you are going to see some of that too. That's one of the reasons why you see such a big difference when you get to larger and larger molecules. Um, we just looked at how at an at an energy value for why are the bigger things, why do they have less or more unfavorable interactions? Um, but that's exactly that's part of it. And that's why they, I don't know if you remember, but that table that had the, the energies listed, like it was like, oh. Methyl, methyl interactions, one, three diaxial interactions, those are bad, but they're not that different than ethyl, ethyl, and not that different really than um, diisopropyl, because you could still have one way of rotating these so that you have the hydrogen spacing. When you make one of them a T butyl group, then all of a sudden there is no way you can rotate this where it's not running into the other one. And it was a huge jump as far as what the difference in energy was between axial and equatorial, right? So, but yes, the, the ability of this to continue rotating is going to affect those uh, as well. We think of them as just, this is one object that has kind of big and bulky, but it's a one object that's irregularly shaped. So it can still rotate and that's gonna change things as well. For the most part, we're just gonna look at the average interactions when we have something like that. Um, so we, and the easiest way of looking at the average interactions is either equilibrium constants or just overall energy, um, which is why we didn't break it down. Because as you can also start seeing, as we get bigger and bigger molecules, um, there wind up being so many possible steric interactions, and twists and bends, and um, that we wind up being not being able to really separate them out because they're all so intertwined. 
Like how easy it is to rotate this depends on which way this one's facing, right? And so we start not worrying about separating out every possible interaction and just looking at the average effect as, as an energy value, basically. Gotcha. Did we talk about IR in here at all yet? A little bit in the lab. Okay. Yeah, that's that's one. The infrared. Yeah, infrared spectroscopy. Demonstration. No, I just want to IR spectrum. Let's just say. Um, so here's an example of an IR. So this is wave number of light, which is, of course, is proportional to frequency. So you can think of this basically as the energy that it takes that something is absorbing. Every one of these peaks is a different energy that that molecule will absorb energy at. In other words, it's a different vibration or, or twist or bend or torsional interaction um, that is going to have a slightly different energy than the others. And as you can see, at, at the higher energies, and at the, I don't know where they go from right to left, um, the high wave numbers, higher energy, there's fewer of them. But as you start getting down in here, this region um, is called the fingerprint region because basically all of those different twists and turns and bends and tweaks and um, start getting impossible to actually interpret anything out of this because there are just too many possible combinations. So you can treat that like it's a fingerprint. Literally, like you could take, you could measure this and say, okay, I don't, I don't have any way to interpret this section, but I can upload it to a database and it'll try and match all those frequencies as best it can. Um, just like CSI, you know, sending somebody's fingerprints into a database to see if they um, match anything, right? Um, so all that to say, you're absolutely right. And we're not gonna get too much into it though because it starts getting lost in all those other possible vibrations. Right. Thank you. <laughs> It's a good question. It was worth going into so that IR will make more sense. Um, we're not just ignoring things, we're just sort of zooming out as we get to bigger molecules. So I guess we are ignoring them, but <laughs> all right, for this one. Again, now we have one three five. And B is the completely cis version. Right? So I would start, if I was solving this myself, I would start by drawing the one where everything is consistent and see if that's going to give me something favorable, like something where I can interpret it before I look at the one where two are the same and one's different. So if we look at B first, well, for, for one, it is okay to make that connection that, okay, well, one three meant, um, cis meant that I could have both axial or both equatorial, right? So one three five, I should be able to say the same thing because the cis positions for all these are gonna look like that, right? And so if I can easily draw all three of them in the cis position or in the axial um, position when it's cis, when I go through a chair flip, all three are going to be equatorial. So, and just for the sake of drawing that, I'm going to wind up with those are all three in the equatorial position, right? And if I took one of them, it doesn't matter which one. One of them is not cis in this case, right? So pick two of them and make them the same and then make the other one the opposite case. So let's just take that one and we'll switch it to being 
equatorial. If that goes through a, a chair flip, we're going to wind up with two equatorial, one axial. But because this one had the ability to get all of them equatorial, that's going to be the more stable molecule. And if you wanted to go through the chair flip here to get them more stable, um, the more stable on Kmer, see if I can. That would be our more stable complement of A, but it's still not as good as B. Is it more stable because two of the three substituents are equatorial? Exactly. In this case, we have two methyls interacting with each other, bumping into each other, as well as hitting a hydrogen over here. Versus, in this case, we have one methyl bumping into two hydrogens. So that's a less unfavorable interaction because it's one big thing and two small things, as opposed to two big things and one small thing. And both of them are better than if we could have three small things interacting. I always like to use people fitting into a car as sterics, right? In this case, you have the one, three interactions here, here, and here, it's going to be two, two big guys and one child, say, bumping into each other in the back seat, versus two children and one big guy, versus not having to put anybody in the middle of the back seat, essentially, or three children in the back seat. So, say it was a uh, six methyl cyclohexane. I'll go all the way around. Hexamethyl? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so would it still be equatorial? All of them being equatorial, saying they're it's cis, they're all equatorial, would that still be? No. The most stable, no? Because the cis position, or the equatorial position, switches from being cis to trans. Hmm. When we go from, from carbon one to two, uh, right, so... And we'll go color code this one. We'll do all of the axials in red. Versus And so just looking at the axials, red and red on the one three are cis, but the, this red one is trans. So all the even numbers are opposite, where trans is going to allow you to be um, most stable. Interesting. And having all the odd numbered carbons, it's the opposite, where cis allows them to both be equatorial at the same time. If you had one, two trans, then one would be axial and the other one would be equatorial. If you had one, two trans, or oh, wait, uh, one, two cis, I mean, yeah. One, two cis, yeah. That, and that's the example that we did, one of the first one we did, right? That would be putting one here and putting one on this blue one here. Those you can, um, if they're cis, that's a case that you can't get them both equatorial at the same time. In same for one, four. You can't get, if they're cis, you can't get them both equatorial at the same time. So there's no general. There is, you just have to remember that it alternates depending whether it's, it's um, even or odd. <laughs> but no, not an easy one. Not an easy one. <laughs> well, it's one of those things that the more times you draw this and you see that, especially if you draw all the positions, you start getting the hang of, Oh, it starts, you start to internalize it a little bit more. It's a little bit easier to wrap your head around. You start being able to develop, oh, it's one, two, cis. That, that's going to be, that's not going to be good because you can only get them, you know, you can only get one of them equatorial. 
Right. You just start, to, the more you practice, the more you start being able to do it mentally, just like arithmetic. It's easy to get like confused being cis, being like, oh, then they both have to be equatorial, they both. Right. Yeah, you can't fall into that trap. So I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah, just clarify. Yeah, I'm gonna ask a question about the Spanish language and the Spanish The naming stuff. This one wasn't wasn't so bad. One, two, dimethyl, cyclopentane, and you everybody for the most part remembered you had to say cis. So we spent so much time with cyclohexanes, right? Um, don't be so worried about cis that you forget to write cyclo. <laughs> but it's not that that it's a lot of things to keep in track of, but none of them are that hard on their own, right? And the alkenes, I'll blame myself, and nobody's going to miss points for missing cis or trans on these, on, or miss any points on the alkene one, because we didn't officially go over it. Um, but it's the same general idea as the ring structure. If it's going to be, um, if you have an alkene, especially it's called an internal alkene, meaning it's not at the end of the chain. Um, so if, if it was that one, would not be an internal alkene because one of the ends of it hits the end of the chain. But if it's an internal alkene, you're usually going to have um, a cis versus a trans. And, and so the, in this case, think of the pi bar as the alkene as the, the plane of the ring. This one has to go across the plane of the ring, which makes it trans. Right, so, this would be a full name for this, be trans to hexene. And as most of you figured out, I've been using the term and um, I'm sure it's not too hard to figure out why, right? It's an alkene is the function group. It's one of the reasons why we could name the function or memorize the function groups early on. Um, it's because most of the names are tied to the name of the function group. So an alkene, you end in ene. Alkene, you end in ene. Um, the other way that, that, and I haven't checked our textbook for this year to see how they present it, is sometimes you wind up burying the two in the middle of hexene. So, and that'll make more sense when we start getting more complicated molecules with more than one functional group. Um, it, but you could say that this is trans hex to Ian. Still same basic idea. Um, this is a little bit more universal because if we had, um, what, we'll, what we'll see is if we had another functional group on there, this, that's a way to put the number to both of them. So for instance, if we had an, I'll put it over here. We had an OH there. That's an alcohol, and we name alcohols by dropping the E at the end of alkane or alkene and putting OL. And so in this case, you could say it's um, two XN six all. It would still be trans, yeah. Gotcha. As a way of saying, okay, well, the two goes with the in, and the six goes with the all. So just so you've seen that, because that's the sort of the new school way of doing things is to put the two, the numbering, right next to the functional group as opposed to in front of the molecule um, to avoid confusion that way. Would you ever see this X two and six all? Probably. Good. Um, that. Seems more confusing than clarifying. That seems more confusing than clarifying. <laughs> Typically, when you see the two bear or see a number buried in the middle, it's because you've already put a number in front. So you can't just, because if this didn't have the alkene, you could just say six hexanol or one hexanol. But the fact that it's got both of those function groups means we need to number both of them and we need to be able to say which one is where. And so this is what I've seen more commonly. Let me see what it looks like right now. X two N six all. 
Yeah, I mean, especially you get into biochemical molecules, you start getting more than one functional group. If, if it doesn't have a common name for whatever reason, then um, I, that doesn't look that unfamiliar to me. You know how when you sometimes when you just look at a word and like I can't tell what it is, but I know that word's spelled wrong. Um, I thought that that's what this was going to look like to me, but it actually looks better than I thought it was going to. Um, and the other, we'll stick with cis and trans for now. After we do R and S for chiral compounds, I'm going to teach you a different way rather than cis and trans for the alkenes. Um, that is more technically more universal. And again, the new school way of doing things that has a subtle difference to cis and trans, but it basically means the same thing. Um, but we need to learn the, tri the priority method for substituents first. So we're going to do this and then we'll take our break and then we're going to do this again because this one takes some practice visualizing things, right? Tetrahedral structures are harder to visualize than flat planar structures, right? Especially when you're looking at them on a flat surface. So for enantiomers, if we want to distinguish between the right-handed versus the left-handed, the way we do that is by assigning priority, similar to the way that we do cis and trans, by saying, oh, the two substituents are on the same side of the ring or on opposite sides of the ring. In this case, though, because we don't just have above and below, we have three dimensions we're kind of working with, right? And so they would we do that is we assign priority to the substituents on the asymmetric carbon. So the same way that, that I drew that, that two bromobutane earlier, I drew it zoomed in on that second carbon, right? As a way of saying, um, okay, here are the four different things attached to this carbon. So you want to start by looking by redrawing your molecule, where at the asymmetric center, draw it in our typical tetrahedral form. And then we're going to assign priority to all the substituents. And the priority goes just based on the atomic number of what's directly attached to the asymmetric center. Higher atomic number, higher priority. Once we've done that, and if there's a tie, you go to the next atom out. Pick the biggest atomic number that's attached to that, to that part then or that whatever molecule it is, and see if, if you can get a tiebreaker. And you go until you get a tiebreaker um, one way or the other. If you reach the end of the molecule without breaking a tie, then either there was a, there's another route you can take and you do the same thing again, and but you have to take a different path the second time. If you keep doing this and you can't decide priority, because no matter what you do, it seems like they're the same priority as a tiebreaker no matter what, then you might not actually have four unique substituents. You might actually have two of those substituents being the same, even though it didn't seem obvious at first. All right, once you have the priority, and then you can, you can redraw it sometimes is somewhat helpful, and just with one, two, three, four instead of the whole big substituent. So one's our highest priority, four's our lowest priority. We're just gonna rotate this molecule so that four is pointed into the board. You just have to remember that that means everything is gonna move, right? So if it's a three-dimensional object like this, usually the way that I find it easiest to visualize this is that you're gonna hold, the carbon stays in the same spot, obviously, so that's where we're rotating around. Pick one of the other ones to keep the same and spin it like it's a propeller, like it's a fan blade. So if we want to put four where three is, I'm going to hold one constant and I'm going to hold the carbon constant and I'm going to twist these three on the bottom. So four goes to three, three goes to where two is, two goes over here. Just it would make just as much sense though to hold those two constant and twist these ones, right? Just twice. Not, not even really. You could take a. If my four is my is the uh, my thumb right now. 
you can twist it this way twice or once the other way. It doesn't make sense. Or, or it's, it's pretty easy to make it work either way. Make it set, make sense. Um, so once you do that, so in this case, if I'm going to I'm going to rotate it that way. When I redraw it, I'm going to have carbon here. One stayed in the same spot. Two is now the one coming out towards us. Four is the end of the board, and three is over here, right? Once you do that, you just draw an arrow one to two to three. If your arrow is clockwise, then it's R. If your arrow is counterclockwise, then it's S. Um, and I'm blanking on why they used R. This makes sense to be right-handed, but for S, um, it's the Latin for left-handed is sinister. Um, so actually, they're not they weren't calling left-handed people. Sinister. Um, sinister meant left-handed, and it evolved over time into it means evil. It's the other way around. Because right. um, the people speaking Latin didn't really have that same sort of um, connotation with left-handed being evil and witchcraft and things like that. Um, so that came second. But either way, in this case, we draw ones, two to three, we get clockwise, so it's R which doesn't mean that it's going to rotate light clockwise because naming things by atomic number is not necessarily all that tied to physical phenomena, right? So it could be right-handed according to our priority system, but still rotate left counterclockwise or rotate light counterclockwise. Normally, I wouldn't even define defined optically active at this point yet. We get this down, and then we'll say, but and it can also rotate light. But since you asked. All right, so we get practice with this. When we come back from break, let's come back at 10 after, and we'll practice this. Why don't you give us more practice problems before the homework? Because I like the homework and got like destroyed. And I, was, like, I did too. <laughs> I had like a full because like I just overthink everything. And I was, yeah. Like, oh my god, I did so bad. This is gonna be terrible. This is gonna be terrible. I know. It's good. Be, like, I'm just gonna calm down. <laughs> I think you can draw one, right? You know, it makes sense. And I was like, yeah. Okay. It's not really like, cool. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah. but yeah, no, I bombed that so it's bad. So and then, like, once I saw it, I was like, oh, that's what matters, the axiom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I was thinking too hard about, like, trans work. I was like, trans is what makes it the most stable. Yeah. It makes it's sense. <laughs> you know, and I literally took it to my boss, and he used to teach this class. Like, oh he's really? a biologist, and, like, yeah. he was like, yeah, that makes more sense. And I started drawing, like, a form, which was like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. But his first impression was the same thing. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Makes me feel better. That's good. That was good. That was good. The first one was just like, it's trans. It's trans. Yeah. 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 Maybe the book, or I don't know if it was Sean, or at least the book, at first, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's trans. 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 It's
it's just hard because it doesn't if you said in the question like oh like something about you know which one's gonna have like the hysteric interaction like totally or whatever yeah. I was also thinking like twist you know the torso one too yeah you know, and like it's so hard to like visualize and yeah uh, like you said, we're only getting like two questions. <laughs> and then it's yeah. yeah, I know, I know. Like, practice problems. I like the feedback too, you know, like when you answer something to know if you're really right or wrong. Okay, I'm just feel like, that sounds right. Yeah, that's a good brain. Like, yeah. It's hard to kind of show you that. It's easy to like put in your answer and see the right or wrong. Yeah. How's it going? It's going good. You work in crazy hours? Or? It's not too bad. I just go to work like after class all the time. Okay. And then like weekends, I work all like 12 hour shifts. Yeah. So it's a lot. Like I don't have any free time. Yeah. So I'm like digging myself into a hole. I know. Me too. I'm like, like feeling like sort of depressed and doing everything fun. Yeah. I just want to ride my bike. So I don't want to Like, great. It's like making flashcards for anatomy. Um, I've been signed up for a lot of classes this quarter, thinking, like, oh, I'll be working out like heavily. It's really slow right now, you know? So, yeah. like, I'll go hard on the classes so I can go easy in the winter. And then, like, they extended my like internship, and like, it's still like falls and falls apart. Yeah, it's rough. Yeah, it's rough. I'm going to have to go, I think, right? <laughs> I've been like, I can do like school work while I'm at work because, like, you know, you're not running a shift all the time. Kind of and so I'm like, well, we can do it. And then they're like, let's do trainings. Let's do this. Let's do TV. Like, but yeah, that's good. I mean, it's fun doing like the calls and stuff. We saw one guy who got like jumped by his ex girlfriend with a baseball bat, wow. like whacked his knees and everything. It was pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was fun. I mean, he had a terrible day, but that was fun. I'll give you a Yeah, I don't know. We should do What do you do after internship? Or liquids. <laughs> 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 I don't water testing. Sometimes I drive around and get samples. Sometimes I just have all day and do yeah. water test. And that's not stupid, right? Yeah, that's what I was like, where am I? It's pretty fun. It's serious, but. You have to have like a bachelor degree, you have a full time job. It's like unions, so they're so strict on that. And, you know. I heard it's really competitive too. Yeah. 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 There, it's it's weird. Um, they make it seem like it's fair and competitive, but then they just hire the people oh. that they already know. <laughs> so it's like very like think like nepotism or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that. So it's like trying to get into the hard part, but then you know, like once you know something. And have a reference like internally, then it's easier. Because my started people were like, like, oh, you're new here. They're like, they're like, who, who are you with? I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, does your dad work here? Mom, like, oh. I'm like, everyone's very new starts. Like, yeah, it's like so like, yeah. Like, yeah. That's through the city, right? No, it's not actually. It's 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 like a separate district. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's through the county then. I would assume that's the district, like water district, municipality yeah. district, municipality. So it's um, because we operate in the county, we operate in Myers. Um, so it's beyond South Lake Tahoe and El Dorado, but not the entire El Dorado. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's so just part of area. We just have like our own district, yeah, yeah. like our water district, and it won't, it, it, it like stops running at Nevada. None of our water can cross yeah. Nevada or that's really good, yeah. So do you work with the county hydrologists at all? No, we have our own hydrogeologists who are like Mark Silos and I get to hang out with them a lot. It's like out on the marsh and we were like digging like sand because we were rehabilitating a well and it was like a bunch of sand was coming out of it. So we had to like go capture it all to like show a little hot like water board, like, hey, look at all the sand we're not putting in the environment. <laughs> nice. But he's really cool guy. Yeah, he's 
far, like PhD. Uh, yeah, my buddy works. He's the hydrologist for the county. For the county. Yeah. So maybe there's a but. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, sure. they want to try awesome. to get yeah. the county because the county they treat him way better. Than the city. Really? Yeah. yeah. This, I worked for the city a year ago, and it was like, but, they, yeah, they like cut back all the pensions and shit like that. But the water district here is cool. Clean and really good. Yeah. yeah. I bet it's just the TRP that keeps me to go But we like that. That keeps us busy. So lab <laughs> and regulations are like what keep us employed, you know. So you know, <laughs> the hydrogeologist said that I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like I would consider getting into that. And he's like, yeah, it's better in California. There's more like regulations like elsewhere, there's less like compliance, you know. Right. So like a lot of like lab jobs are like to help operation stay in compliance, you know, mm -hmm. like, so that if you go to Nevada where they don't care, you don't get, like, let into the water, like, yeah, <laughs> it's not that serious for people, though. Not as bad for it at all, yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, everyone talks like, I'm kind of pulling into so much regulation, I can't dig or do anything with that, and it goes upside and downside. So, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. It is interesting stuff, especially up here with all of the different the whole watershed system that yeah. we have here is crazy. Yeah, like our, our treatment process, we can't like compare ourselves to anywhere else because most places have like a sewer company and then they have like a freshwater company. Mm -hmm. And then usually the sewer company can just like dump into the river or whatever, but we can't do that. Like we can't dump any wastewater anywhere in the Tahoe Basin. So we like pipe it all the way over Luther Pass and it goes way out to like Markleyville. We have like a reservoir there and then we have a whole like irrigation network that goes to like all these ranches that use it. So I mean, have to go test all the time. It's pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. They like, just like the water board could determine like, this is how we have to do it in Tahoe. And so when they like have these crazy like high regulations, and so the like, treatment companies like, okay, like, that's what you want us to do. We'll hire people to do all this. <laughs> do you guys work out of the keys at all? Like with that? Oh, they're separate. They're completely separate. Our camperage too. The keys the keys go on. The fast with that. Well, so they they want us to buy them and take it over it, <laughs> but we're like your guys is like infrastructure, so it's so bad. <laughs> what are we gonna do with that? We have to reinvest, like, and so yeah, we like acquire the keys. It's buy it for five million and put ten million. Yeah. Like, it's just like, good ears, you know. Yeah. It's not like private. Company. It's like great ears, you know. Which is like good people fixed incomes, you know. So we can't like jack up the rates just because like rich people in the keys like don't want to. Pay what they should have been maintaining their water. That's what property tax is for. Yeah. And that's why all the people that have their second homes here have to pay their giant property taxes, even though they don't live here. They have higher property taxes than the Keys, and they have like the worst water infrastructure. Well, that's because the Keys are an abomination. No <laughs> problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, the Keys and the TRPA exist. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody's like, this is. Messed up. What are we yeah. doing here? <laughs> I just want the lake level to rise back up so that the keys can just be underwater. <laughs> <laughs> like then, it's, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, I was talking to a bunch of the Gen Chem students that are all panicking about their midterm next Tuesday, and it reminded me that we have a midterm <laughs> next Thursday. Yeah, no. Um, so it's next Thursday. There, Sorry, there is a Yes, a second. Yeah. Um, there is a practice test on the week overview for this week, and that'll be, you know, and we'll put that into the same category as lab reports as far as it, it will be an assignment. Um, but just to look at it real quick so that we're all on the same page um, for now. Um, OCHEM, the, the the pace of OCHEM typically means that we don't get a full lecture period of review like I try to do in Gen Chem. Gen Chem, the pacing is such with us being on three quarters that we usually have enough time to do that. Um, OCHEM usually it's like half of the lecture of review. So we'll have, we'll be finishing things, finishing up lecture next Thursday and then, and then after break next Thursday will be review. Um, and I'll look at the schedule, but I don't think we'll have um lab and so actually what that's you're right that's what usually happens only one lab section what we'll do is we'll take the um test during lab or sorry it's on there's the shoe what <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So if I manage to get the test on a Tuesday, let's let's double check that before I go any further. The final was on a Tuesday. So okay, so next um, Thursday, a week from Thursday is going to be the test. So that means next Tuesday is going to be is wiggle room for me to finish lecture stuff. And the review is going to be during lab. So a chance to ask any questions, work through the practice test is going to be the lab section. So then, and then we'll take the test in lecture on Thursday. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, this is off because we're going to synthesis of one bromobutane this week. But then, yeah, next week, next Tuesday, we'll be finishing up lab or finishing up lecture topics and then going into the review for Tuesday afternoon. So, no new lab, though. So, no new lab next. Okay. All right. So, with that in mind, um, the structure of this, the, the way that the topics line up in OCHEM doesn't lend itself to doing the 10 parts, 10 part test where every part is 10 points. Um, there's just not that many individual topics in OCHEM. There's fewer topics, so I tend to kind of chunk things up based on how much time I've been spending on them. Um, this one does say I managed to do 10 sections, each with 10 points. Um, but a lot of times what will happen is it'll be a, a page of reactions um, where you have to complete the reactions, and that winds up being like, or two pages of reactions winds up being 40 points. Um, rather than having 10 distinct, because we'll get into the point where the volume, the bulk of the volume is going to be predict the product of this reaction. So rather than have that only be 10%, it winds up being more than that. Um, so constitutional isomers, um, what's the molecular formula, what's the hybridization for all of the lone pairs, how many of them are delocalized, stuff weird all pretty familiar with OCHEM builds nicely at least, right? So we've been still using all these topics. Um, draw resonance structures and rank them, name things. From the name, draw the structure, from the structure, draw, or write the name, all that good stuff, right? Draw your Newman projections. That's supposed to be Newman, not Neiman. I think, unless I've been saying it wrong all this time, but I'm pretty sure it's Newman. <laughs> uh, that looks familiar, right? Um, so, and then a lot of the last few sections are going to be, are they enantiomers, diastereomers, constitutional isomers, or the same molecule? And we're going to define diastereomers today. Figure out if it's R versus S, which is what we're just learning right now, right? And then this is the last topic um, before. The midterm is going to be, here's a potential energy surface. What is this reaction? What properties is this reaction going to have? Where are the transition states? What's going to be slowest? What's going to have the biggest equilibrium constant? So tying it back to gen chem, we're going to start applying it in a more holistic, if that's the right way to phrase it, like more all-encompassing way, as opposed to in gen chem, at least when I taught this, these subjects in general it felt like they were a lot more silent from each other. Rates and equilibrium were kind of two different topics instead of being two sides at the same point. Um, and then we'll see, see how much we get to mechanisms as far as that last part goes. But anyway, just so you've seen the, the practice test, like I said, we haven't gotten to eight, nine, and 10 yet. So don't be too intimidated by that. We still have, you know, two and a, two lectures roughly left um, where we're going to cover that stuff and then on and go through a review until you feel comfortable with stuff next Tuesday afternoon. Nikki, can you like show like the answer key at the end of like the yes. session? Like the absolutely. I just want to make sure. I it <laughs> might even be if it's not linked already, then then. It's easier. Yeah, it's not linked here, but I have it. I should have it saved somewhere. So I'll upload it so that we can go through it and check your answers and stuff before this weekend, probably. Um, so you have the weekend to work on it. And then 
that's kind of on on you on next Tuesday. Like, hey, you wrote this in the key, and I have no idea why you wrote that or what that means or how you got there. Um, and we'll go through the steps to do it. Um, but you can use your key to check your answers over the weekends. And will we have a quiz? No, we'll be doing this instead. All right, so let's go back where we ended. On paper, it's a simple enough process, right? And realistically, the way the where people typically trip up is not in assigning priority, because once you get the hang of that, that's simple. It's in the rotating to get number four pointed away from you. That's tricky for people. Um, it takes practice to be able to visualize. So you, you know, holding two of these the same and then treating the other three like a, like a rotor works. Um, there's a couple other tricks we'll see as well. For instance, if four is sticking out of the board towards us and you want them and you want four to be behind the paper or behind the board, the other way you can think about it, if it's easier for, and this is easier for some people is to say, okay, well, what if I was on the other side of the wall? If I was on the other side of the wall, then four would be pointed away from me and everything would be where it needs to be, right? It's a three-dimensional molecule. You can make the molecule move to fit your perspective or you can change your perspective. So that approach works as well and kind of cements sort of think about it in 3D. But let's do some practice and see if there's any particular spots people are getting hung up. So for the first one, it looks complicated written that way. Um, but that's, they've actually done some of the work for you as far as rewriting it so, so that it's tetrahedral shape. How do we go about assigning priority here? So for this first one on the far left. Biggest one is the third grade school. Two VR and one. Correct. But so I'm going to be really specific, biggest in terms of atomic number. So the first thing attached to this carbon in all four directions is another carbon, right? So all of them are tied. If we had a, a BR attached instead of um, a methyl group here, that, auto, that wins right away, number one priority, because it's the first thing that's attached that you look at first. And then, since they're all carbons, now if they're all tied, you go one step further. And when you go one step further, this one, right, you have to pick an H, right? And everything else has something within a higher atomic number. So that's going to be four. I usually start from the bottom up. Or... If it's obvious, I kind of start with the extremes. So like you said, one is going to be the one with bromine, right? Because the next step after a carbon is to a bromine. So after two steps, it's really obvious what one and four are. Two and three are a little bit trickier because both of them go to another carbon, right? And then both of them make a third step from this carbon. Both of them go to a hydrogen, right? So... And I'm not labeling priority here. I'm just labeling first step, first step, second step, second step, third step goes to, it has to go to a hydrogen because you're always, you're continuing down the same path. So we got a tie after we got to the end of the molecule, both of them, right? With those two carbons, the CH, CH32, were those two carbons about to be attached to each other? They're not attached to each other. They're attached to the, to the first carbon. So that's that's one way of, of writing a um, isopropyl group. Yeah. So C, H, C, H, three, C, H, three versus C, H, two, C, H, three. So for both of them, first step, first step, carbon. Second step, second step, carbon. Third step, third step, hydrogen. Go back to the beginning. Do it again, but you have to pick a different route this time. First step, first step, carbon. 
second step here goes to another carbon. Second step here has to go to a hydrogen. So this is higher priority than that. So that's going to allow us to say to assign three and or, uh, two and three. Second priority, second highest priority, third priority. With the total amount of protons, so atomic number, would that have more priority over the lesser protons? Is that no? Because you can have something um, attached in a different order that has fewer protons, like. Like say if this was um, an OH instead of a methyl group, that's fewer total protons than the carbon followed by the bromine. Mm -hmm. But because the oxygen occurs first, then that breaks the tie immediately, right? So it's always it's sequential steps is the, is the trickiest part. You, you can't generalize just based on molecular weight. Although push comes to shove, if it's all the same atoms, almost always it will be higher molecular weight is gonna wind up being higher priority. Um, but no. if it's not all the same atoms, that falls apart. All right, so one, two, three, four. It's already arranged nicely for us, right? We happen to get one where the priority puts number four into the board already. We don't need to move anything. And that's the trickiest step. One to two to three. It's R. And as far as naming the rest of this molecule, once you have figured out that it's R, it can be helpful to redraw it in skeletal structure so that you can do your regular naming. But the rest of the naming goes the same way. You're just going to say R in front of it. So we have CH2. BR, C, the methyl group, and an ethyl group. And an isopropyl group. But that, writing out that, this tricky structure might make it easier to see where our longest continuous carbon chain is. And then you could further clean that up if you wanted to draw the structure in true skeletal structure. One, two carbon, two carbon, a methyl, and an ethyl, and then it would look something like that. We've got it all the way into its Skeletal structure, right? What's our longest continuous carbon chain? It's four. And there's two different ways we can get four. So let's pick the one that's going to make our branches as simple as possible, right? If we if we just do this, we have two methyls and an ethyl attached. If we went This way, we wind up with having to use the parentheses, new methyl ethyl for that group there, right? Wouldn't be wrong per se, but it's usually better to keep the branches as simple as possible. So our overall name here Is going to be a butane with a bunch of prefixes in front of it, right? One bromo. Two, three. Two, three. I'm going to erase butane because I'm going to need to put it on another line here below. Two, three. Dimethyl. Oh, oh, we did this wrong. Longest continuous carbon chain is five. The idea of putting an ethyl on carbon two butane made me rethink that. Um, 
just continuing with the way it is right now, and then we'll, we'll redo it as the pentane. Um, 2,3-dimethyl, 2-methyl, 1-bromo, 2,3-dimethyl, 2-ethyl, 2-butane. And then we put R out in front of it, usually in parentheses, to be R one bromo two three dimethyl two ethyl butane. Or if we do it properly, many years that I've been doing this, it's still I still mess up counting, finding all this carbon chain from time to time. This is our longest continuous carbon chain, we're going to have pentane and it's still going to be R, R23 dimethyl, what do we do with this other group here? Three parentheses. Bromomethyl. Bromo the three has to go outside the parentheses, so otherwise you're saying you're putting something on a different carbon within the branch. We're saying where the whole branch is, it's on carbon three. And then, R, 2, 3 dimethyl, 3 bromomethyl pentane. Um, and for whatever reason, I don't feel compelled to hyphenate in between bromo and methyl when they're in parentheses as, as much as I do when they're outside of the parentheses. Probably because the parentheses already offset everything as much, but it would, using this, the standards we've been using, it wouldn't be wrong to put bromo dash methyl. Um, that, that looks really wrong to me for some reason. <laughs> oh, for the second one, it's much simpler molecule, right? But it's not drawn all blown up for us yet. So start by drawing it blown up <clears throat> with everything in the same position. Don't try to move anything yet. We have three substituents drawn. What's the fourth substituent? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. And where is it? Yeah. Remember that when you've got tetrahedral shape, two of your bonds are in the plane, and then what you're into the board and out of the board are always generally in the same direction. So they have to be close to each other that way. Okay. And this is where that winds up making a difference. Up till now, if we've drawn, as long as it was two in the board, in the plane of the board, and one in and one out, it didn't really matter where you put the one in and one out that much, right? Now it does, though, because if you put the one coming out of the board down here, that's going to change how you count things, right? So you need to keep into the board and out of the board more or less in the same, in the same third of the circle, right? You break it up into the three groups of about 120 degrees. What's our highest priority going to be? Chlorine. What's our lowest priority going to be? Hydrogen. Pro 
what will be next highest, right? Because carbon to carbon, so tie one more step, you get hydrogen or another carbon. Now, the trick is we're going to need to rotate it so that the hydrogen is into the board. So when I'm when I'm doing my keep everything, keep things constant, rotate the other three. Usually the way that, that works is that two of the three that you're going to rotate are going to be the ones into the board and out of the board. So you're going to keep one of the ones that's in the plane of the board still. And again, if this looks complicated like this, redraw it right up real quick. One, four, three, two, just to clean things up. We want four to be in the back. back. Make the one that you're keeping constant, make this the carbon, the asymmetric center, make that the heel of your hands, make your elbow the other one you're keeping constant. And then make three fingers for the other three. So if I hold two constants, four is my pointer finger, right? So I want pointer finger to go like that. Heck, you can paint your nails, right? One, two, three on one, two, three, mm -hmm. and use that. That's not a bad way to do it. Just don't confuse yourself with priority if you wind up keeping, um, you know, if it, one, two, three, just to keep them straight. Maybe it'd be better just to do different colors rather than numbers so you're not going to trick yourself that way. Yeah, so four is my pointer finger. We're doing that now. So three moves to where four was. Four goes one, one comes down here. Four, one, three, there was our two. One, two, three, and another R, right? I haven't seen an S yet. This is not one where it's going to be substantially different if you get an S. One, two, three, and we just ignore four. This four is into the board. So this would be R to four O and N. Where did they grow up three? It rotated that to the same effect. It yeah, so still, it would still be R. Four is still my pointer finger, right? We're gonna do this now. So Four is back, two is where my thumb was. So two is going to be here. And one is going to be down here. So you wind up with one, two, three. Still R. And you'll find it right handed and left handed. It turns out if we're going to keep this one still, you're going to want to use one hand. If you're going to keep this one still, it works best to use the other hand because your hands are chiral. So we'll just come in the other <laughs> In the sense that hopefully you're getting a sense that everything is more complicated than it seems. <laughs> All right. This last one, we won't name the whole molecule because we haven't done we haven't done alcohols yet. We can still assign priority and figure out if it's R or S. And so, and here's your example of different order means priority. This one has the highest weight, has the most protons, but the oxygen is directly attached. So first step, you have carbon, 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 or an oxygen. Oxygen gets highest priority. Said that and then go to <laughs> one. What's our second highest priority? The bromine. 
the one bromine right there, all carbon after the first step, and then a bromine, and that the other ones all go to another carbon. So this is also a, class, a good example of one where I don't do one and four first, because there's no, if there's no one that's obviously number four. Um, I don't have a good way of like, oh, if you do it this way, you're gonna wanna do one and four first. And if you do it that way, it's kind of just like, if you can look at it and tell easily, then assign one and four first. If not, do one, then two, then three, then four. Exactly. So carbon, 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 and chlorine or hydrogen. So chlorine, and here's four. So in this case, four is in the plane of the board. And the way it's run, you can take this and redraw it in a way that makes sense to you, but be careful because that's number one way that you're going to mess things up is going to be, I'm going to redraw this to be more convenient, but you switched two of the numbers when you did it and didn't realize. And so as much as possible, you're going to want to keep them in the same position while you're figuring all this out. So in this case, we want to move four. So I'm going to try and keep two constant. So four is my pointer finger again in this case, ish. Well, maybe, maybe it makes more sense to do it this way. Four is my thumb now. And I'm going to take it and do that. So that means that four is going where three is, three comes forward, one moves over there. Two didn't move, four is in the back, three came forward, and one's over here. Still are. Um, just pure chance. No, there's nothing in nature that makes R more likely than, than S uh, or anything like that, or I just random chance when I grab these molecules or when I build them. So you took this, you rotated around that bond. This one right here, this middle one, just to make a point here, we had one, three, two was over here, and then four was sticking out towards us, right? For the middle one. This is a good example of one where for some people, it makes more sense and they're able to visualize it better. If you picture stepping behind the board looking this way. So, you would draw it one to two to three like this. But if I'm looking at it from behind the board, it looks like this, right? So, so in some you know, physically turning around can, have, can, can help that. Or like, okay, like this, I'm going this way. And then <laughs> it's actually harder to do than it seems to keep it going the same way when you're doing that. Cool. Right, so, exactly. Like tightening a bolt from the opposite side. Um, but for some people, that's easier to visualize. Some people like a more mathematical approach to it. If four sticking out towards you, you're looking at it from behind. So draw the arrow like normal and then just flip it. If four is sticking out towards you, it looks like S, but then we're looking at it backwards. So it's actually R. That helps. I, I'm trying to throw a whole bunch of stuff at the wall. You don't need to use all of any of this. If you've got a way of thinking about it, it seems like it's making sense to you stick with it. I'm just kind of throwing stuff out there just so we see different ways to think about this. I appreciate all the perspective. I've been doing this a little bit and I got I got thought this is the right way to do it. Um, and it never quite made sense to me until I could actually visualize it in 3D. And then I started seeing all the different possibilities. And since then, I've seen a lot of people come in and, oh, oh I think about it this way. Um, all right, one last point here. If you have a compound that has two asymmetric centers, you can have up to four stereoisomers. 
right? Because each one of them could be R or could be S. So you can have one R, two S, one S, two R, one R, two R, one S, two S. So think of like a Punnett square, right? Um, these are enantiomers because it's a mirror image of the opposite. So if you flip both of them, one R, two S goes to one S, two R, you flipped both of them to the opposite enantiomer. This is a mirror image. These two are a mirror image of each other. And same with these, if they're both R to start and they're both S at the end, you flipped both of the asymmetric centers, right? These two are not enantiomers because you only flipped one of the two stereo centers. You flipped the, the um, carbon one from being S to being R, but you didn't touch carbon two. This would be like, these are enantiomers, right? If somebody's hand took your right thumb and put it over here, that's not really an enantiomer because it's still your right hand thumb, but now it's backwards, it's attached in the wrong spot, right? It's a different thing. You can four finger stops. Yeah, pinky and forefinger are opposite, but your thumb's next to your pinky instead of next, like that's not a mirror image anymore, right? That's a different thing. That's a, called a diastereomer. So a diastereomer means that it's a stereoisomer, but it's not a mirror image. And it's written up at the top, but just to. And if I go back to the practice midterm. If things have the same formula, there are really four options. If it's the same molecular formula, it could be a constitutional isomer. If you actually have things attached in different places. It could be an enantiomer. If it's got a non superposable mirror image, it could be the same molecule just drawn differently. Or it could be a diastereomer, where you flipped one of your stereo centers, but not all of them. So for instance, this molecule right here. And typically the way I would, I would assign, I would go through answering one of these questions. If you treat it like it's a multiple choice question, then that makes it a lot easier because you can use process of elimination, right? We can look at these two molecules and say, well, I know that they're not constitutional isomers. It's tetramethylcyclohexane and they're attached on all the same carbons, right? Carbon one, two, four, and five. So I know it's not a constitutional isomer. And I know it's not an enantiomer because you flipped, this one didn't change, right? And this one didn't change. These two flipped, but these two didn't. So I know it's not an enantiomer. If it was an enantiomer, everything would be switched. And I know it's not the same molecule because we have we have two cis and two trans, but here the two trans are on opposite corners. And, and here the two trans are on the same side of the molecule. Or sorry, two cis, I should say. So therefore, the, what's left is it's a diastereomer. Right? And that's that's gonna be the easiest way to approach this because diastereomers are kind of all encompassing. If it's not one of the others, it's gotta be a diastereomer.
So for A, these two compounds, I'll also add, are they, or are they the same molecule up there? Are they the same molecule? Yes, sir. If you took this one and you flipped it like a pancake, they'd both be pointing upward then, right? But you switched where the OH was. It was at the top, and now it's on the, on the second card, right? It's not the same molecule. It has two asymmetric centers, two carbons that have four different things attached. Actually, it has three. There's more than that, right? It's three asymmetric centers, which means there's, in theory, up to eight possible stereoisomers. Two times two times two. We flipped two of them, but not the third. So diastereomer. If this one was also drawn with the dashes, then we flipped all three of them and it would be an enantiomer. Cool group way of figuring it out. It takes a little bit longer sometimes, but when it's not drawn in an easy way to look at it, if this one we have it drawn in a different orientation, right? Assign your priorities, figure out R and S for both of them. If you know what R and S and R and S, if they're both the same, it's the same molecule. If they both flipped, it's an enantiomer. If one flips but not the other, it's a diastereomer. And so here, just real quickly, there's a hydrogen drawn coming out towards us, right? That's going to be fourth priority. Then the methyl. And the ethyl, the highest priority is going to be the biggest thing in this case, because it's all carbons and hydrogens. So one to two to three, but the force pointed out towards us. So one to two to three, going the other way, it's going to be an S, right? So we've got three S and no, nothing changed over here for, for this one. We didn't rearrange the rest of the carbon structure. It doesn't apply to this one, right? So here, now we have the hydrogen facing in the back already. So three, one, two. One on the right is three R. At least that first one is mirror image. You got to look at the second second stereoisomer. We at the at the very least we know it's not the same molecule, so it means it's either an enantiomer or a diastereomer. So erase everything. So we can do it again. Four is pointing out towards us. We get one, two, carbon versus, so this is going to be three is the methyl again. And we get carbon and carbon, so tie, carbon and carbon, so tie, carbon and carbon, tie. One more carbon in a row on the right hand side. So here's our highest priority, here's our second highest priority. And if we wanted to keep something still here, we could keep priority one still and rotate, make four my thumb. We're going to do this. So two is coming towards us now. Four is going away from us. Three rotated to where two was. And now one to two to three. So it's three S four R. Come over here and we do the same thing. We still have the hydrogen as our lowest priority coming out towards us. 
So four. Yeah, that would be pointed slightly different direction. Four. This was priority one, right? Here's priority two, here's priority three. The nice thing about these doing the same molecule twice in a row is you can, if you assign, we already assigned priorities for all four of the substituents. The priorities aren't gonna change, just their arrangement might. So four is coming towards us. If we hold two constant again and put four backwards, four is my pointer finger now. Can't quite bend that way, so I might have to go. <laughs> um, we're going to wind up four is going to go backwards. One goes to where three is. It's carbon. One, two didn't move. Four is away from us. And that means three is now coming out towards us. One to two to three. So it did switch, right? It's one to two to three. Now it's counterclockwise, so that's S. So 3S, 4R, 3R, 4S. We flipped both of them, so an antimer. Right, so all of this, is, part of this is this is a good topic to teach right after you learn R and S, um, partly because you have to do a lot of practice for determining R and S and assigning priority. So it's going to, at the very least, you should get good at doing R and S, even if the whole idea of a diastereomer is tricky to you still. That's fine. You'll get there. It's just a vocab term, meaning one stereo center didn't change, but the others did. It would be incorrect to just, what I did to tell you is an antimer. I just mm -hmm. mentally just flipped it and made them look alike. If if you can do that consistently, then yes. The way that this was, these two were drawn, I had, especially with the biggest chain no longer being in a straight from left to right, it was a little bit harder for me to visualize that. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely do that. If you can just take this and rotate it so that, so that the um, bottom chain is going to be in, pointed in the same direction there, and you're going to wind up with the methyl sticking out towards us, and then the hydrogen is going to be up and to the right, which is not the same as over here. But yeah, that's um, that is one way to do it. The other is one other way. So anytime you switch two of the numbers you flipped it to being the mirror image. But if you do that twice, yes. then it's back to where it was. Yeah. So that's another approach that you can have. It's okay, well, I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna switch these two. That makes it the mirror, a mirror image. If you switch it again, like switching one of these with the hydrogen, then it would be the same molecule again. If we switch two of them without switching the hydrogen or where the rest of the molecule was. That's another dead giveaway. If you're, I don't like that because it's the idea of switching back and forth between the molecules when you're trying to assign the priority seems counterintuitive to the idea that they're a three dimensional object that we should be rotating around. That's absolutely a way that you can you can do that if it makes sense to do that. If you switch two though, and you want it to be the same molecule, you've got to switch two more. And effectively, us rotating three positions is doing that. We're switching one for two and then two for three. Would that be like taking a mirror to half a mirror? That's like, it'd be looking at a, it'd be like looking at a reflection of a reflection. Yeah. But it would be half it would be like a diastereomer. Yeah, if you only did that for half of it, then it's a diastereomer. Think about like writing uh, stickers on a car. You're looking at it in your mirror. They're backwards, but if you're looking at a mirror of a mirror, then they're forwards. And if you only hold up the second mirror to half of it, then you get a diastereomer. Remember, half of the letters are the right way, and half of them aren't. 
basically diastereomers go back to the same thing. Diastereomers are an abomination. And when something looks wrong, it's probably a diastereomer. <laughs> So are they like less frequent or less stable than? No, <laughs> they're just a pain. <laughs> um, let's, let's see, where's the, um, like isoleucine? Iso there's, a, there's a few um, amino acids that are diastere that are, can have two stereocenters. And we only want, use one stereoisomer out of the four possibilities. But in theory, they could have you could have a, a diastereomer um, version of an amino acid. But nature selects one thing, not a host of things at once. And so we only use the right-handed versions of all amino acids. And those ones that do have another stereocenter, we only use one version of those. Um, all right, we're already over. Um, so we'll start talking about meso compound on Thursday and then get to energy. All right. And again, we can do the same thing we've done before. I went 10 minutes over in lecture. We can start lab a few minutes late. If you guys want to show up at 10 after, um, get your little break, get some lunch, and we'll, uh, we'll start lab at, at 10 after one. <laughs>